Hello and welcome back to another coding session with Mr. Jacob. Today we want to further extend our mod player here, which we call RetroPulse, which we have been developing over the last couple sessions. Uh, the last time we created this nice little uh, UI here using Tailwind and using ShadCN components. And uh, I've actually only did one touch up here. I changed this slider to only show this thumb when actually you are hovering over it. Um, and otherwise it's only showing us the position because I want to have this a little bit neater when it's displaying later on where in the actual song we are currently are. Um, but that's everything I changed UI wise from the last time. Um, then I did something that I'm going to talk about in a second. I migrated to Tori V2. Um, we will talk about this a little bit. But what, I, what we essentially want to do in the current session now is, um, as we created the last time this UI, we now want to kind of attach this UI to our Tori slash Rust backend so that actually when we are playing things, uh, we have some information here like, um, what's the current position within our um, played song? What's the duration of our song? Where actually needs this position here to be displayed? Something like that. We want to actually create a communications channel from the back end of our Rust application into our front end, which can then send information along this channel into the front end to be displayed there, to be processed there in any way that we find necessary because until now we only can communicate with the back end from the front end so i can click the open button i can open a mod file here and as you can hear it is playing in the background now then um, uh, we can pause it i can play it and these are commands that are sent from the front end to the back end but now what we need here is we need to communicate some information from the back end into the front end. And we need to take a look on how to do this actually. But first I want to quickly tell you that I migrated from the Tori 1.x version that we were using before to the most recent release candidate of version 2 of Tori because we are at, I see here, release candidate 11 of the version 2.0 of Tori. And um, I've actually chatted with um, some folks from the Tori project on their Discord. And they told me that for a project like this, which is now begun and started out now, that the, the V2 version would be ready enough to just use it and that it has a couple of neat features that, we, that might come in handy for what we want to do here. Uh, so I decided to migrate to the V2 version, um, th to the release candidate of the V2 version, which really seems very, very complete and wholesome. So I guess we won't have any problems um, with that. Um, I actually used their migration tool for that. So migrate Tori V2. So if you are going to do uh, more or less the same thing. Just go to this upgrade and migrate page and click on the upgrade from Tori 1.0 and they actually have uh, those two commands here. I didn't do anything more than just copy this and paste this into my terminal and it automatically uh, migrated my configuration, my main source file by loading pr appropriate plugins because now something like for example the dialogue handling and stuff like that is done in a Tori plugin as they have a very complex and very well working plugin system now and it automatically migrated all of that so that after that process finished I could just run my application and it was working exactly as it was before. Um, of course we have a quite little code base um, and yet so um, it, your, your mileage might vary there. You might need to adapt something actually uh, manually if you are migrating a big project. But um, if you are starting now, I guess use Tori V.2 uh, re release candidate, um, uh, v V2 release candidate if there isn't any specific reason why you should not. Um, okay, so um, I migrated and it works out fine. I uh, just wanted to tell you that, that you are not wondering why we are 
now using actually uh, V2 if you follow this, this series along. So now what, what do we want to do? Um, I actually already read some things or searched in this documentation and there was something uh, which caught my eye, which was this section here, which sounded like exactly what we wanted, calling the front end from Rust. So that's kind of what we want. And there is the same event system in place that there was with Tori um, V1. Uh, which actually is the capability of simply firing an event on the main window, on the web view window that we have our application in, and then we can register a callback in uh, on that uh, on the front end and actually listen to that. Um, but there is another thing which caught my eye, which I really much liked. It is the possibility now to create, uh, where is it, um, typed channels. So what we can actually do is we can have a Tori command just like we had before. And it has an argument which is a channel with a specific type. This type needs to be serializable into JSON by 30. And then we can actually send this channel data. And this channel kind of stays open and it is simply then used to, to process this. Uh, uh, it stays open as long as this um, object exists here, as this um, thingy exists. And it is uh, then sent to the corresponding counterpart in our uh, front end, which then looks kind of like the same thing. We have a channel here, which we can type as well using TypeScript. And then we simply define such a new channel object here and we um, just put it into our invoke call there. So this on event thingy here is our channel. And beforehand we can register this on message callback there, which is then essentially called every time the, uh, the Rust backend pushes something into that channel. And I guess that would be um, a really nice thing to to actually use um, if it's working. <laughs> I have no idea. I haven't tried it before. Um, so for our case where we uh, could implement something in order to simply subscribe to our player events and then we could push all the data uh, into this channel to transport it to the front end. So I guess um, I want to simply try this out and then see how we are actually integrating this with our player because I guess it will be a little bit tricky um, uh, because our playback is happening in a separate thread to, to decouple it from everything else and we somehow need to transport the player information out of this thread into a place where we can send it then to the channel. But we will we will um, take a look at that when we are at the, when we are there when we need to to address this problem. Um, until that, I just want to see that we have this communications channel first. So I guess um, we we can just start doing that by simply creating a proper communications channel that we can actually register and deregister and subscribe and unsubscribe and do all the the the, the proper handling there. Um, and then go ahead and really send data through it. So I guess we are starting on the backend side. And on the backend side, we have our commands. So currently we have a Tori command, which is loading a module, one which is playing a module and one which is pausing module. Um, and I guess we create a new one there. So um, if I understood the documentation correctly, you are doing this with a command as well. So we are creating a command here. We are having something like maybe subscribe to player events, something like that. And um, I guess we will need the player in there anyways, because we are somehow needing to communicate with it. So let's put it in there. We have it in our application state anyway, so it shouldn't be a problem. And then if I understood correctly, let's check this example again. We are simply putting um, a Tori IPC channel in here. It was Tori IPC, wasn't it? Tori, Tori IPC channel, yes, exactly. We are putting an IPC channel in there with the type of what we actually want to put in there, which needs to be serializable as 30. So I guess we have something like a channel here, which we then call, uh, which, with, which is a Tori 
IPC channel and I guess it will have a type like, I don't know, player event most likely. Uh, we don't have that type yet, but um, and I guess we will return something from this function, some sort of identifier which will allow us to actually track and trace this subscription to be able to, un to, to, to remove it later on again, to destroy this channel once we don't need it anymore. Because I guess we need to do some cleanup because if we are changing the view in the future or the application is reloaded or something like that, we actually want to stop this subscription before actually creating a new one or something like that. So I guess we need to track that somehow, somewhere. Um, so I guess we will return some sort of string or maybe a number, I don't know, but most likely a string because I'm already thinking about we will most likely use a UUID for that. Um, so now we should have this command here. So let's see. Um, it is already, it is not complaining about not having, oh yeah, now it's complaining about not having a player event. I was a little bit confused here. Um, so let's let's implement this one in a second, but for now let's see how we could actually, or what we could actually do here with it. Um, it seems to me that we can simply use the send function of this thing to send data. So for now, let's just check um, that we can actually do this and how this works by doing send and then, yeah, then sending a player event, which we don't, okay, so don't have actually. So let's define one. So I guess what we want is an enum called player event. And maybe we could, um, yeah, what, what what would we have there? Something like maybe the, the play state, something like, is it playing? Is it paused? Is it stopped? Something like that. Maybe we should, um, uh, emit this first because that's that's something that we can actually easily emit I guess so um, maybe play state or something like that or um, play state changed or mm, yeah how would we actually or, or are this just events like playing yeah I guess it's just it's just a player event called playing and um, paused so currently we have these two states we can be playing or we can uh, be paused yeah I guess that's that's enough to test isn't it? So um, so let's send this player event play maybe just just for the for the sake of it to, to just see if this works and this and then we, we we need to return some strings. So let's ju let's just return fuba into here. So just for the sake of being. Uh, proper here with our re re um, uh, return code. So this doesn't work. Expect the std string found what? Wait, channel send, isn't this, isn't this how this works? I thought this is, so you call send and you put this in there and then you get a, okay, so the trade bound player event IPC response is not satisfied. The following other types implement 30 serial. Ah, okay, I see. So uh, yeah, player event isn't serializable yet. So um, I guess we can derive that. So player, uh, no, serialize. So let's derive 30 serialize for our player event. And now is it working? Mm, IPC response not satisfied. I'm not sure that this is Oh, it's uh, it's building there. Okay, now it's that that seems to be fine actually. So, um, I guess this will already work maybe. So let's um, let's actually go to our page TSX and let's see how this actually would work by just wait a second. What what did just happen there? Oh yeah, <laughs> it was still running and it is. Um, it is rebuilding every time we we change something. So I've just quit the um, the uh, the rebuilding process there. So um, I guess we can do something like use use effect here from React to call something uh, the moment this thing is mounted. Um, let's Im add this import here, and I guess we can then do something like. Um, how would this type actually look like? Let's let's maybe define that. That would be a player event. And did we actually specify how to serialize that? No, we did not. So what are they actually doing here? Maybe we can steal some inspiration there. Um, 
they are actually camel casing everything, which makes sense, I guess. And they are then putting the tag uh, in the event thingy and the content in the data field. That actually kind of makes sense so that we always have an object which has a field event, which is called like our enumeration part. And then we can put data in there and the data is then in the, in the, in the data um, section. This actually makes a lot of sense. So let's let's just steal this 30 um, command declaration uh, um, here uh, to to make it uh, process it like that. Then I guess we can define our player event here because our player event then is um, is uh, currently either something like type. Uh, what was it playing I guess or it is an object called with a type um, with wait what did I do there type um, paused isn't it so that's what it actually can be currently yeah and now I guess we need something like uh, we are in no we are defining first the new channel that was how it was done so channel wasn't it was, wasn't it? Let's see. So they are, yeah, they are defining the type. Uh, we only have the event there. Oh, it's actually, oh, it's most likely lower casing this then because camel casing, yeah, camel casing starts lower case. Yeah, makes sense. So uh, this will be most likely the event there. And then they are, yeah, they, they, they are creating a new channel here and then registering this on message thing there. So let's do that new channel of the type player event. And I, I really much like that we have uh, in, uh, import from Tori as API, uh, that we have type safety here, I hope. So um, now we can do channel on message. And this one would be, uh, would take a message. And now if I see it correctly, this should be properly typed, isn't it? So yeah, messages of type player event. Okay, this this is really nice. So now let's do console lock uh, received um, player message or player event. And then let's put the message there. Or even we could put uh, the type there because we actually know player event of type and then the type. Yeah, something like that. Okay, so now we need to invoke um, the, how did I call it? Subscribe to player events. And if I understood correctly, now we need to put in our channel property here, don't we? And after that, we should actually receive those events. So if I'm right, then actually we should now, when we start this up, see in our debug console, the message. Let's see if this works, because if this works, we already have our communications channel. Then we just need to, to wrap it up a little into a little bit more registering, unregistering magic. And then we should even be able to, to send data between the threads, which uh, uh, the, the front end and the back end there. So now let's see if I open up. Okay, there is something wrong. Unhandled promise rejection command subscribe to player events not found. Subscribe to player. E Maybe I um, <laughs> let me see. Maybe I I just uh, named this wrong. So main RS subscribe to player events. Hmm. Oh, did I did I register this? No, I did not. Of course not. Okay, so I need to register this command with um, uh, actually with this generate handler thingy here when uh, setting up the Tori application so that it is registered to be called from the front end. Okay, so now let's see. <clears throat> Rebuilding here. So let's see if this now works as it should. Okay, so I made something break there. Um, okay, what did I do there? Uh, is not Tori runtime command arc. Some, some, something is not right here. Um, something is not right here. Where is it? Player there. 
Okay, so it seems that this macro cannot be executed. The Tory bound player event command arc is not satisfied. The trade command arc R is implemented for channel T send. Error originated. Wait, what? Error originated from macro call here. Yeah, that's. Okay, so the trade bound is not satisfied. The trade is implemented. Hmm. Okay, why? It, it seems to not be able to register this thing. I guess it has to do with our channel. Let's just comment this out and let's see if it can then actually, um, if it can then actually register it. Okay, if we go away, if we are, uh, if we comment this channel thingy here out, it works. So it has something to do with our channel. So. Let's let's take a look at the uh, example again. Okay, so they are putting an app handle in here, but we don't need that. They are putting another value uh, in here, and then they are just putting the channel in here. And the channel is, either uh, the type is just an enum, as it is with what we are doing there. Um, it is serialized. No, oh, it is they. Hmm. They derive clone there. Maybe maybe this thing needs to be clonable. Let's let's just for the for for the sake of it test this. Clo okay, okay. So we have to remember that the data types need to be clonable and serializable for it uh, for them to be used within a channel. Okay, so learn something again, I guess. Uh, yeah. Okay, so it started again. So let's open up the console and we received player event of type undefined. Wait, what? <laughs> okay, we, it's, it seems that we received, um, at least we received something there, but um, it wasn't serialized maybe properly or something like that. How is this actually working? Do they have uh, some sort of... Uh, yeah, they won't be doing a WebSocket or something like that. They will most likely just push that through the communication channel they have with the web view. Okay, so um, I guess then let's see. Maybe there we did something wrong there um, with the push data. So uh, we have we are sending player event playing here, and the player event is camel case tag event content data so it should actually put this in an event tag maybe i did something wrong here in the logger function mm, so message yeah I, I named it type and not event that's yeah that's kind of the problem there it is called event we serialized it to be an event um which makes more sense, I guess. So we are we are actually really logging undefined, which the case here. So it's rebuilding, and now yeah, and let it, that's that's great. Okay, so I I'm not sure. Can I can I make this? Oh, I can make this bigger. Nice. So as you can see here now, we received the player event of type playing. Um, the reason why we received it uh, two times is that. During a development cycle, the the React front end is always re um, it's it's kind of mounting its components and unmounting them and then remounting them just to check that the proper effect that the effect handlers don't have side effects that are not unregistered, and that's by the way a reason for why we need to do this properly. It's essentially checking that we are doing this properly. What we are doing here, we need to register and then deregister again which we are not doing at the moment but we can see that we are, can actually send information to through this channel and that's that's actually yeah that's actually half of our problem already done i would have thought that this will be much more complicated so thank you tori for for do for for already having this for us even in a in a type safe way which i which i actually love so now Let's see that we do this properly and so that we have an open channel there that we can then use. So I guess what we want to do now is 
we want not to send something here because we want it later on in our player, but we want to register this channel somewhere to, to, to put it somewhere that we can actually use it then. So I guess what we want to do is for now um, register this, yeah, I guess on our player because our player later on needs the list of, subscribed, of subscribers. There may be more than one. Um, to handle them. Once an event is, has popped up there, it needs to be transported into those channels. Yeah, okay, so I guess, oh, I already, again, stopped, uh, didn't stop the, the worker there, the, 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 uh, the runner there that recompiles every time we change something. So let's see, I guess we can do something like, on the player, subscribe um, to events. I guess, and we will put the channel in there. And then this thing could or should actually return some sort of identifier. Yeah, so I guess we are simply uh, giving the player the opportunity to do that. But as it is in a mutex, we of course need to acquire the mutex lock first and unwrap that. And then, yeah, there isn't such a method. That absolutely and fully makes sense. So let's implement that one. So our player now leads a new method there um, and it needs a new public method. Do we? There, there we have the public methods. So let's do a pub fn um, subscribe to, oh, is it, does it need to be public? Uh, I'm not sure. Currently, Currently not, I guess, but um, we might move the player later on. So the, the API of the player, in the sense of the API of the player, this should be public. So subscribe to events and we put, um, I guess, a mutable self in there. And I guess we put a channel in there, which then is, it did it already? Yeah, it already suggested that. So the channels should, the, the Tori channel with the player event there. Yeah, that's exactly what I want. And I want to return a string, which is our identifier. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay, so um, okay, so now let's let's think about that. I guess we need to store those events somewhere, and I guess I want to store them in a hash map with this string identifier. So uh, let's create one, I guess. Um, where is our player? There, player. So, um, event or um, subscribe event channels subscribed subscribers. Let's just call uh, subscribers. The, the 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 thing here is subscribers, and it will be a hash map, which will map from this string identifier that we will need to generate to a Tory IPC channel. Uh, 2n which takes um, a player event to transport it then and yeah um, we need of course to import the no I didn't want to make this smaller I just wanted to import the hash map please thank you uh, however I guess as we will be accessing this from within our multi-threaded player where we actually have a playback thread and stuff like that. I guess we will need to put this hash map into a mutex. We will definitely need to put this into a mutex because we will be accessing it from different threads and we can only access it from one at a time. So uh, let's do this and then, yeah, I guess we need to uh, create this one. So our subscribers will be a mutex new hash map new and it will be empty at first which is perfectly all right um, and then now we should be able to go back to our subscribe to events function there and now we need an identifier and i guess we need a uuid for that and therefore we need the cargo and uuid create don't we um okay we are in the wrong folder let's go to source tory cargo add uuid not UUI, UUID, please. Okay, and we need uh, it with a feature V4 because we want a random based UUID. Okay, perfect. Now we have that. We should be able to do something like let UUID equal UUID, and I always forget how this thing is. Something like 
new or before or new there was wait let's first oh uh, let's first import uid and now let's see again new because I, yeah new v4 yeah exactly that's that's what i want <laughs> and i actually want to convert this into a string directly because we need a string representation so now what i want to do is i want to do self subs 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 Oh, subscribers, please. I want to acquire a lock on the mutex. I want to unwrap that. And then I want to insert the UUID, um, essentially a clone of the UUID, because we will need to return the one that we uh, re recreated there. And the channel, channel, come on. Does this, does this work as I would expect it to? Yeah, it seems to be working so now we're turning the uid okay so we can simply put this channel into this subscriber hash map perfect okay so i guess we can implement the unsubscribe then here as well because we will need it in a second so unsubscribe uh, from events and i guess this one then takes the ID or UUID, which is a string and it returns a boolean telling us if it could could remove the subscriber or not. So if it was there or not. So therefore we are actually getting the mutex here. Yeah. And then I think it is called remove. Yeah, exactly. So remove and remove. Uh, remove the key from the returning the value at the key if the key was privi previously in the map. Nice. So, and otherwise it will return, it's returning an optional? Yeah, it's returning an optional. Perfect. So what we can do here actually is we put the UUID in here and we simply do an is sum here. So if this one, if, if it's not in the map, then it simply will return none and we will return false in the end. So, and if it's in the map, it is removed and we will return true. Okay, nice. So we already have our unsubscribe. Um, now, where was our subscribe to player events thingy function? Okay, so actually we are now doing this here. So we need another toric command. We need, I guess, unsubscribe from player events i guess and i guess this one will take an id which is a string and it will return a bool come on and it more or less just calls this thing with the given id and returns its uh, return value and then we will need to register this one as well so unsubscribe from player events and if i sh would be able to write this correctly unsubscribe from player events it would be even nicer so uh, by the way i hope you are not unsubscribing but maybe if subscribing to my channel if you haven't done already so please subscribe give it give the video a thumbs up if you like it so far thank you <laughs> okay uh so now we actually should have those methods so let's go back to our page tsx and let's see where were we um where is our there is our use effect function so what we now should do here is we create this channel okay fine then we invoke subscribe to player events and now we get back the value but this is an asynchronous call isn't it yeah, it's returning a promise. That's kind of a problem because use effect actually strictly is as uh, is synchronous. Um, the the problem here to to just um, sum it up a little is usually you can do something like within the use effect function you can return a function and this function is actually called. Uh, once this thing is either run again due to a change of the dependencies, which we actually didn't supply here. So usually you have here a dependency, like for example, a state or something like that. And each time the state is changed, this effect is called again because the effect is then to, um, 
assumed to be influenced by the state. We only want to, to render this once when the component is actually created. So we are using use effect here and um, just using this empty uh, dependency array here. But uh, once the component is uh, recreated or unmounted or stuff like that, this function here is actually called, which is the finalizer or destructor kind of of this use effect. So it is called then to clean up. And what we want to do here actually is we would like to unsubscribe here. However, this one is actually asynchronous. So how would we handle that? Um, do we actually need the return value of this one at any other point where we... No, we don't know. We don't need it. We only need it in the, in the moment we want to unregister this. Okay, so we can do something like this. This should actually work. This should be the subscription promise. So I'm not awaiting here or doing anything else. I'm just storing the promise here and then uh, in the unregistering, um, I'm doing something like subscription promise uh, then. So once it is finished, please take the um, subscription ID or it's, let's just call it ID. Then I can take it for the other invoke call there. And then I'm calling invoke again with unsubscribe uh, from player events. And then I'm giving it the ID. This should actually work out because um, it will either have this promise resolved here already. Then it will directly call this more or less um, and therefore invoke the unsubscription here. Or if it hasn't finished this call when it is at this position, it will simply register this function for when this promise is resolved and then this will happen. So this should actually work. Um, the reason why this works is that uh, we can actually handle multiple subscriptions. So we are not enforcing that you need to subscribe, you unsubscribe before you subscribe again. So essentially what we could have is here, we could have one subscription, then another comes by, comes by because this thing is re-rendered. Most likely this will happen, by the way. And then uh, the, the first one comes back and is now fully fully loaded, fully functioning, and therefore these uns this unsubscribe is called on the first one again. But that's no problem because we have um, a cleanup there which is working. So I guess this will work. So maybe we could... Um, Maybe we could lock this in the, where are we, main RS. So where do we have our commands here? Uh, so maybe lock this here, something like um, ePrint line uh, regist um, subscribing, subscribing to player events, something like that. And maybe here we could lock something like unsubscribing from player events uh, with ID. We actually have the ID here, so we can put it there, ID. Um, and maybe we should lock the response of this here as well. Just, just put it in a debug statement for now. Uh, the macro to the rescue here so that we actually see the IDs and the response. Okay, now I'm I'm a little bit curious actually how this works out. If, if it works out, <laughs> I'm not sure there. We will, we will see, fingers crossed. So actually we should see something now in the terminal here like um, subscription. I guess we will see subscription, subscription, unsubscription because the, the render cycles will be uh, uh, that fast that two subscriptions will be fired before the first unsubscription will be handled asynchronously. Okay, nice. So this actually seems to work out. So let's see, there is a subscribing to player events, yeah, with this ID, with this UU ID. Um, then there is, okay, you can't, you can't fully see that. Let me scroll up. So uh, yeah, with this first UUID, we have a subscription, then we are subscribing again, because as I said, it's in the dev cycle, it's rendered twice. 
and then the first subscription is unsubscribed again. Okay, that's that's actually exactly what I wanted it to do. Okay, that's that's really nice. That's re okay, that's that's really cool. So this is actually working. Um, by the way, I can quickly show you that um, if it's not in death mode, um, then this rendering cycle will not happen twice. Uh, uh, let me show you. Yeah, so there it built in uh, in build mode, in release mode, and now uh, I, I don't even know. Can we do something like run, Tori, run? Is there a something like that? Okay, there is not, but uh, we can definitely do something like um, there should be a target. No, um, how is it called? Uh, target. Yeah, it is called target. So target, and then there should be release, and then there should be the executable here. So if we call that actually we should see that, yeah, as you can see, there is only one subscription. No, you can't see because my face is in the way. But as you can see here now, there is then only one subscription um, because uh, the React system is not in the dev mode. So it actually works. Um, like I said, it's only in dev mode doing that. And uh, you might have uh, seen that the, the rendering of the UI and the startup and everything is a lot faster there um, as well. So um, let's go back into the usual folder here and let's uh, nevertheless uh, take a look at what we want to do next. Um, okay, we wanted now we have now this communications channel, I guess. So that's that's really nice. Now we need to to put some information in there from our uh, player side. So let's take a look actually where our play thread is. There it is. So. This is actually, I need, I guess I will uh, refactor this um, uh, between either in the next session or between the next session to be just in different different files and stuff like that because we have a lot too much in our main RS by now. Um, this is here actually our um, player thread or our pl playback thread, you could say. This is the thing that actually handles the player commands that we are sending in there from the, the base thread loading the file, creating the corresponding CPAL streams to, to just read samples from our mod file using libopenmpt and then putting them into the audio device for playback. So um, that's actually handled in here and we will need to streamline and properly handle this um, a little bit more in the future. But nevertheless, we have the, the essential data, that read data feedback function here that's actually what's creating the sample data and putting it into our cpal output stream um, and it's handling the playing and the pausing and all that kind of stuff and essentially this is the thread where we have our data so from this thread we need to actually transfer messages mm, somehow into all of those registered channels and I'm just thinking about how we might do that because I guess I don't want to directly send that from this thread here, but maybe through an intermediary because um, I don't actually, I, I don't know how much um, time it takes to serialize all this information and send it to the Tory front end. So, I guess I want to just from this channel here because it, it needs to, to handle all the playing and stuff. Um, I just want to maybe push the information out through another MPSC channel. So within our Rust Tori backend there, the same communications, uh, the, the same way that we are communicate, communicating already with our playback thread here. Uh, which is which simply has a receiver where information is pushed in. So you can see that when you, for example, tell it, tell the player to load something, it simply uses the uh, a sender a, a channel which is going into this playback thread to to push a command in there which tells it to load the file. And we could actually do the same thing but backwards, so that the playback thread has a MPSC sender as well, which it can use to send events out and then the player itself can somehow handle those events and may redirect them into the Tori channel or not. 
that actually makes kind of sense. So this way we would be able to process them within the Rust code itself as well, should we need to. Yeah, okay, I guess that makes sense. Let's let's first do that and then let's push those um, into the channel to the front end there. So I guess then we need to rename a couple of things. So now we have not, uh, we will have not the only this sender here, but this is actually, I guess, a playback sender. So um, that we actually have a way there of um, sending something into the playback thread. This will then be the playback join handle for now. Yeah, just, just to make sure that they are properly identified. Yeah, that makes sense. So I guess now we need something like um, maybe an event sender then. No, the event sender would be part of the of the um, the playback thread. How would we actually pass on the information? I guess we would have another thread for that, most likely. <laughs> yeah, I guess so because something needs to read then from this channel and then act on incoming messages. Yeah, so I guess we will. We will have another thread here. So let's create um, maybe an events join handle. Um, and this will be an option join handle with an empty, uh, uh, empty tuple there as well as data type. And uh, yeah, that will be somewhere there. And we will need to have this here as well. So this will be an events join handle, which is none uh, when we start. And I guess this will now be spawn playback thread. Let's rename that. And I guess we will need something like spawn event thread as well, because we need another thread there. Yeah, I guess so. So um, fn spawn event thread, exactly, mutable self, and it will steal a little bit of code here, I guess. So this will be the even something something join handle and we need to uh, spawn this here. For now it doesn't do anything. And now I guess we need we need in this thread, we need more or less the same as in the other. We need a, uh, we need a loop here. So something like a receive loop. We will need to be able to break it anyway, so we can name it the same way we did here. And then we, are, we need some sort of receiver actually that we are receiving data from, but I guess we are not matching that because we don't need to decide on that. We only need to take the event uh, and pass it on. So we will kind of need, we will see in a second where we get this receiver and how we need to wire this up. Just trying to get my, um, to get the logic clear here. Or maybe we will need um, to handle the event there to terminate in case of a termination event. But for now, let's just, let's just, let's just see. Mm. Okay, we would need to have this event and then pass it on to, um, to pass it on actually to our uh, hash map here that we have. The problem is that the hash map we can't access. Ah, where were we now? Damn. Well, there. Uh, the hash map we can't access within this different thread. Um, so we, I guess we would need to put the hash map. I already put it into a mutex, but I guess we will need to put it into an arc as well. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's let's do this in a second. Let's for now put um, a to do here. Um, pass event on to all subscribatory channels, something like that. Yeah. And now let's let's get the uh, the receiver in here somehow. I guess we can maybe give it into this 
thing as a function here. So I guess we can have a receiver here, which is an um, MPSC receiver, which takes, um, which takes actually, um, what was that? A uh, player event, isn't it? So this receiver should take a player event. Yeah, exactly. So this should take a player event. And we can put it in there by, can we, can't we just create it here? Like when we are spawning this whole thing. So we have then here something like, um, was it with sender receiver or sender receiver, which is the order here. So sender receiver is the order. So sender receiver, and we simply create a new MPSC receiver, no, uh, channel. Um, with a player event type, I guess. And do we need to unwrap that or did it, what does it, uh, it seems to return fine. So now we can actually put the receiver in here and then we put the sender in here um, and give the playback thread the, wait, uh, it now takes an event sender which is an MPSC um, sender of player event. Yeah, that, that actually that that actually could work. And now we can transport this event sender channel here. Uh, so this this sent part of the channel we could now transport into this playback thread and use here. Yeah. So let's see. We we could actually do that. So. Um, once this thing is loaded, we found out that it is automatically uh, starting to play. So once we have loaded this thing, let's just put in here, um, uh, um, how did we call it? Event sender send, and it's a player event playing. Yeah, I guess so. And we need to unwrap that. Okay. Let's take this and the play command does the same, but only if it really calls, I guess, play. Otherwise it shouldn't do that. And the pause command will, will send the paused. And op upon termination, I don't know, maybe we will want to send a termination event or something like that, but we will see, we'll see. So now we should actually send something into this um, channel. Now we need to process what's in this channel and pass the event onto the subscribe Tori channels. But for that, in our other thread, we need access to this hash map where we are storing this um, Tori channels. And as we cannot access self in here, or I guess we can't, I've actually never tried, but it wouldn't make sense. Let's, let's see. Can I actually do something like ch for channel in self dot Subs subscribers uh or no let's let's call it subscriber uh value i guess would be the right thingy here don't tell me this actually works no method uh, uh, oh yeah it's it's a it's a it's a mutex there so i guess we need to first do something like subscribers equals self subscribers dot lock uh, dot unwrap, but I, I think this will not this I think this will not work. And then we can do subscribers value here. Um, there is a method values with a similar name. V v values. I want val. Wait, well, use. Uh, borrowed data escapes outside of method. Yeah, yeah. Self escapes the method body here. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. This, this, this does not work. So, um, as I've expected. So we need to put that actually in an arc, um, and then it, it should actually work, most likely. Let's let's just wrap um, the subscribers into an arc to put them on the heap and make them reference counted uh, in an atomic way across that. Uh, so this should actually then maybe work. We will see. We will see. So we now have an arc and there is a mutex in there. And now I should actually be able to do something like let subscribers equal self 
subscribers dot clone. I should actually be able to clone or to, to get a new reference, a reference counted reference to this. And this I should be this reference I should then be able to move into this thread. Um, so that now actually I should be able to do that. <laughs> Awesome. So, um, yeah, maybe I shouldn't call this one subscribers or hmm. yeah, maybe I should, uh, um, I should call this here subscribers mutex or something like that, just to, to differentiate, differentiate, differentiate it from the actually taken uh, lock there because I want to drop it directly after I have finished working with it so that the other thread can actually access this mutex then. Okay, so now I should be able to do something like I have the subscriber now, which in turn is the channel. So I, sh I should be able to do send and the event, we are actually using the same event there. So I guess I can do something like that. Okay, event, use of move value event. Yeah, I guess um, we need to clone that here because um, this is only a reference and I can't I can't take it actually out of the hash map. Um, no, wait, this event is why? Wait, what? Stop. What is it? What is it complaining about? It wasn't complaining about the subscriber. I would have thought it complains about the subscriber. So why is it actually complaining about event? Use of move value, value moved here in previous iteration of loop. Oh, yeah. Okay, that makes sense because we need, yeah, we definitely need to clone this event because we need to send it to, uh, we need to send it out to every of the subscribers or can we actually give it a reference here? No. No, no, no. It was, it wants, yeah, it wants a full-blown event. So we are simply duplicating this thing um, as many times as it needs this, it needs it because we might have more than one subscriber function. Um, yeah, I guess actually, I guess actually we might now be able to, to send and see those those events that we already put there. So yeah, let's, I guess let's try it. Let's try it. So Tori def, let's see. Okay, so we have subscribed successfully. So let's see, where is our console? Uh, there's nothing in our console. So let's open something. Actually, it should now tell us. <laughs> awesome. So if I press now pause, <laughs> paused, play, paused, play. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, we have successfully implemented a communications channel between our playback thread and the front end here. <laughs> okay, that's, uh, that's quite awesome. So now we should actually be able to, uh, to transfer information like that um, if there is something in, and I hope there is in libopenmpt to, to actually retrieve this information. Let's see um, if we need to, to count um, samples here that we provided already. I don't think that we will do it in this session, but um, let's see, let's see. Let's open up the libopenmpt. Uh, no, that wasn't, I didn't want to print the page. I wanted to do something like openmpt or libopenmpt. Uh, and there we are, there's the documentation, lip, and where actually is this CAPI? There, lip open MPTC, that's actually what I was um, searching for. There, is the, there are all the functions. So let's see, is there something like duration something something? Open MPT module get duration seconds. Okay, what does this actually do? It provides a double. Oh, nice. It provides a 64-bit floating point. Yeah, we can use that. And it, it seems to be in seconds and approximate song duration. Perfect. So I guess let's do that first. Um, I guess let's copy this name here. 
and I guess it will, yeah, it will take an open MPT module. So um, where is our, we have something like struct module. Wait, struct mod, mod module there. Uh, this is actually the thing that handles the um, uh, the open MPT module handle for us. So this this C handle of the sys create there, and this is actually what reads the samples. So I guess we are implementing now something like uh, the function was called get duration seconds. So I guess we call it the same way. So duration seconds. Um, and it's an FN and it takes just the self and it will return an F64, I guess. And then we most likely want to do something like unsafe because we are calling into our lib open MPT sys. And then the copied, the copied method name that I just copied from the documentation. And we will put self how did we call it self 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 handle self handle in it and this one returns an f64 okay so this should actually be a method which allows us to get the duration so is there something to is there, is there something to get the playback something like playback position or something like that um uh, position Set position order, set position seconds, set, 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 get, get position seconds, wait, get current song position, okay, in seconds, the same double, okay, okay, let's, let's see if this actually, if this actually works, that would be awesome, get position seconds it takes a self as well and it returns an f64 i guess come on and it will do an unsafe call as well because we are now calling lib open mpt sys open i did copy it didn't i yeah get position and self handle into that and it should return an f64 okay so let's format and now we might be able to retrieve this position. So um, I guess we need a new player event. Um, something like uh, position changed maybe, or just position update, position update. Why not position update? And I guess position update always gets a position which is an f64 and the duration which is an f64 then so i guess that makes the handling for us easier maybe maybe we will want to separate that in the future but for now let's see so now we, we actually have a player event here um now we need to to send it somewhere within our player so where are we actually playing this uh where could we we now need to call this thing every time we are advancing. So I guess we could do it here, even though this might not be the, the right place for it, because this function is called every time we are reading a couple of samples. So I guess it would be called way too much. So this would be hell impor impor uh, uh, hell unperformant, imperformant, or, or how you might call it. Um, but I guess we can, we can try. So let's maybe do something like, um, we should actually have our, how was it called? Event sender there. And we can send the player event of type position update. And there is this position, and this position would then be mod handle dot get position seconds, and duration would be mod handle um, mod mod handle get duration seconds. This will be most likely inefficient as hell because um, we are always retrieving that, but. Let's for now see if it even works. I have no idea. So uh, let's format that. Okay, there is now something. Use of move value event sender. 
Oh, oh yeah. Yeah, 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 because we can't move the sender into this. We cannot move the sender into this um, method here. Can I actually use it as a reference? No. Um, can I put it into an arc? Maybe. <laughs> Could I do that? <laughs> Let's see if I can do that. Uh, so what actually happens if I put it... No, uh, within this thread, I'm just putting it into a uh, let um, event sender equals arc new event sender. So we take the event sender that we get here and then we are uh, um, let uh, event sender um, event sender <laughs> how do we call it actually reader fn or event sender for reader uh, is an event sender clone okay borrow of move value event sender value borrowed here after m wait is this is this a problem because i didn't tell it here that uh, event sender should be wait can't I do something like can I can't I just put this here into its own scope or something like that and then call this event sender here and simply clone the event sender and it only is in here now an um, yeah an arc uh, um, another reference a reference counted reference to this thing okay this seems actually to work so uh nice 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 um yeah so i guess we are logging that but we are not logging we are not logging the data yet and we need to adapt our type in the javascript so where actually is here our event player event there we are because now we have another type there we have an event um position was it called position update or position updated um position update position it should be called position updated i guess so let's rename this quickly uh, let's go into our JavaScript and do position updated here and it should now have a data tag as well which should have a position which is a number and it should have a duration which is a number um, and let's let's reformat that we can't because we have done some something wrong there now let's reformat okay so that's actually quite nicely reformatted there that is that is our uh, possible player events now and now we are of type <laughs> and let's do another console lock uh, and let's just do not a console lock but a console what 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 was it it is there is another console call there that i already forget that is is it dear i guess it is dear um, which prints the um the given information in a nice nice manner there uh, uh so data or we could actually use table maybe message data so that's oh yeah because it might not be there actually okay so if message uh data so if there is actually data um that's not working out as well because we then need to check our um, message. Mm, okay, so if message event equals um, position updated, then we can actually access the data because then it is there. Okay, that makes actually sense. So yeah let's let's see actually how this uh or what what kind of data this prints if it does even if this works or if it crashes or implodes or <laughs> i have no idea actually 
Okay, so let's open up our console here and now let's open up a file here uh, and let's see. It's actually receiving things. It's receiving way too much things, I guess. Uh, I can't even, is this a problem with the scaling that I did there or because I made it so big? No, it's it's just, it did, it wasn't able to, <laughs> it wasn't able to render this quickly. So, uh, because we are sending a lot and a lot and a lot and a lot of updates. <laughs> okay, table was the was definitely not what I wanted there. Um, let's just where is my editor here? Let's just um, maybe lock this here the the usual way, like message.data then, and let's let's see if this uh, actually works. Let's see. Come on. So there we are, failed to compile. Wait, what? Did I unintentionally change something else here? Oh, I removed um, I removed a brace there. Okay, of course it can't compile this way. So let me let me open up the yeah the console again. Let me open the the mod file. Okay, but that is awesome. We can actually get updates this way. So we know the duration and we know the um, the current position. Even though we are we are sending way too much updates there, we need to somehow limit that. But it, let's let's work with this for now to to make this um, this uh, scrubber here and the the timers actually work so that we have something as the 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 final thing in this video because now we have this communication channel you can we can send it through and then later on we will take care of optimizing that and sending less messages because i guess this will be slow as hell and eat up a lot of processing power that it don't needs to eat up so uh nevertheless let's see we we now have this this information that's that's actually really i love that so um Let's maybe not lock those messages anymore. Let's maybe do something like switch a message event here. And let's do something with, um, if the message event is something like position updated, then we want to do something special. And the default would be to just lock the lock the thing maybe even yeah uh, that would be the default and if the position updated we will do sing things in a second so um, actually I guess what we need here then is we need to store this somehow somewhere in a state so that we can actually use it for rendering so let's quickly do that so const position no uh, const position set position uh, is use uh, state and it is zero by default and let's import use state from react and let's use set duration uh, set set duration and duration as a state use state which will be zero by default as well I guess okay so now when we get a position update we can do something like set position uh, or set maybe we we'll set the duration first and to set duration um, we want to put message dot data dot duration in there and set position is message dot data dot position yeah I guess so so we just put the data into the state and now we can use the state date for the scrubber where is our seeker here there is um, I guess we are not using default value anymore but value and I guess we are just putting in there now the position but I guess we need to no that's not that's not how it's done in JavaScript it's done with math round our position so we are rounding this and the maximum actually then will be math round duration I guess yeah that makes sense sense the step will be one because we are uh, going in one second intervals there 
Uh, okay, now we need a way to display this. I guess we need a function to format our time. So format seconds. Let's do, uh, let's create, hmm? how did I, I don't know, remove that again. Format seconds, it will be a function that takes the seconds, uh, which are a number and it will return um, a string. So let's create that. First of all, I guess we need to, uh, to round the seconds. So math round seconds. And then we need um, the second part. So const, um, yeah, let's just call it S, will be the rounded value modulo 60, I guess, because we want only the part that is still there when we have thrown the minutes away. Yeah, that m should make sense. And then we need the minutes, which would be rounded divided by 60. However, we need to remove the floating point part here uh, because this is still a floating point number and no integer. And now that we have that, we actually need to, to put it into a string, which we need to pad. So we should do something like return. Let's do a template literal here. And the first part will be something like the string version of the minutes pad start, I guess it is. Yeah, and then it's max length fill string. So two and zero, and then followed by a colon, and then there is uh, the conversion of the seconds into a string padded with uh, to two characters with a leading zero there. I guess this should actually format our seconds in the same way it's displayed here. So now I should be able to put in here format seconds um, position. Remove that. Do the same thing again here. Format seconds. Uh, no, this would be format seconds duration, of course, because uh, it doesn't make sense to have the position two times. Okay. And now let's let's run this again and let's see. Maybe with a lot of crossed fingers, we should now see that the that the bar is moving and actually that the time is displayed correctly. It, at least it is initialized correctly. So let's open and let's cross our fingers. <laughs> Awesome! <laughs> it's working! We we have player feedback in here. So uh, we are, have been told by the system that the song is 3 minutes and, thir um, and, and uh, 36 seconds long and that it's currently at position of uh, 22, 23, 24 and so on seconds. And that's awesome! That's absolutely awesome! We of course need to implement the jumping around and stuff like that, but now we have actually a proper feedback channel. Let me quickly check how many um, uh, CPU cycles this is actually burning. So it's now taking 12, 12 something. Okay, um, <laughs> the last time we used this player it was at like one to two percent so what we are doing there with this constant updates and i guess um refetching this data and calling into the lib open mpt library every i don't know a couple of milliseconds there isn't performant at all and we need to definitely optimize that and do this at another position of our player but um but we, we have actually achieved now the configuration. Let me pause this again. The, uh, the, the configuration, the, the, the sending of data from our back end into our front end to stream the data into that when the back end, the, the player thread that we have, the, the playback thread has new data. It is transported cleanly through our application to the front end without blocking anything, without having any problems by just um, invoking a callback there which updates the state and then displays this to us that's that's awesome news and that's that's something that that's exactly what i wanted to achieve and i'm, I'm really really happy that we achieved that 
And yeah, I've, I've learned a lot in this session today. I've learned a lot about Tori. I've learned a lot about this communication stuff. I've again learned some things about threats and so on in Rust, which I like very much um, that I've done that. And um, yeah, I, I, I guess we are there for now where we wanted to be, even though it's a session that is, yeah, a couple of minutes longer than it usually is. But I think it was worth it. So um, yeah, if you liked this session as well, please give it a thumbs up if you stayed until this point. Please uh, subscribe to the channel. And um, if you have any questions or any comments, please write me, leave me a comment on YouTube or something like that, or contact me any other way. I'm always happy to receive your feedback. So um, yeah, again, I hope you enjoyed this one as much as I did, and I hope to see you in the next one. Bye.